The dynamics of classroom relationships have dramatically changed over the past few years. Not too long ago, an authoritative don't smile until Thanksgiving approach to classroom management was the norm. Then the belief was, it was not important for students to like, care about or trust teachers. The emphasis was on obedience rather than cooperation. That is no longer the case. Educators today recognize that trusting student-teacher relationships are essential for learning. This trusting relationship implies that teachers need to move from a controlling approach to classroom management to one which gives students more control over their environment and behavior. However, trusting students to self-manage is just the beginning. There also has to be an instructional component that teaches students how to manage their own behavior. A proponent of this student-centered approach to classroom management is John Irwin. John is the author of two books on classroom and behavior management. He has several years of classroom experience teaching in grades 7 through 12. He is a faculty member of the William Glasser Institute and now works as an independent education consultant for schools and districts nationwide. We traveled to Louisville, Kentucky to watch as John introduced his approach to classroom management to a group of teachers and administrators from the Jefferson County Schools. John began his remarks by talking about how he developed his ideas about motivation and student behavior. In the following clip, we will watch part of John's introduction as well as hear from teachers and administrators who have benefited from using John's ideas and strategies. Motivation was a, very important to me, trying to get these kids to be motivated to learn, to stay in school, and hopefully to go on to college. Uh, it was when I learned Dr. Glasser's ideas of choice theory in a basic intensive week one summer that transformed my classroom from a place that was pretty traditional, pretty, you know, it, I, I didn't have problems in the classroom. I mean, it was just, just kind of okay. You know, the kids came, they did what they were asked to do, uh, lots of B's and C's. Not a lot of excitement in the classroom. I wanted, you know, I tried to get that excitement. Excitement. Every teacher, when they go into teaching, they think that they're going to be uh, like the teachers in uh, To Serve with Love in my generation or uh, uh, Freedom Writers in, in this generation. And you get in there and you realize this isn't going to be as easy as I thought. Um, so, but when I learned these ideas, brought them back to my classroom, they transformed the classroom to a place that was just kind of. B's and C's and you know, everybody kind of got along to a place that was I couldn't wait to get to in the morning. And the students, first our, our relationships got better, then the motivation to be in the classroom and to be engaged got better and finally uh, gradually the, the quality of the performance I got from my students was, was uh, just beyond my wildest expectations. So I've, I've learned this, I've lived it and it, it does work uh, and it's working in classrooms all over the country. The, class, the ideas in the classroom of choice are really just about getting kids engaged in the learning process. Uh, we know that kids have different learning styles. Uh, there are kinesthetic learners, there are visual learners, auditory learners. So the, the, the strategies in my book are really about how to get these different types of kids engaged and to keep them engaged. Activities like the class meeting are totally need satisfying. Uh, the, the inner outer circle structure gets the kids up out of their seat and talking about the content. Uh, the graffiti activity gets them going around to different posters and writing things down and, and brainstorming together. Uh, the in imagery activity gets kids into their heads, getting, getting them to use their senses to imagine what it might be like, for example, to, to, to be in Chaucer's England or Shakespeare's London. It's all about getting the kids to own the, the learning and to, to be active in the learning. So it isn't just about creating a need-satisfying environment, which is good, which is important, 
uh, but also to develop a sense of community and to get kids to learn. Uh, we have seen a drastic improvement from where we were before John Irwin came to us uh, until now. Uh, we have um, noticed that uh, tardies are down, absences are down, um, bullying is down, um, general discipline is down, especially in the middle school and high school because they've really taken the reins uh, as far as understanding that uh, it's okay to be different and, it's, uh, and we need to celebrate that. We do have fewer discipline problems. Um, since the kids enjoy being in the classroom and the teachers have made it fun, um, they, very seldom are they going to act up in the classroom. You know, they're, they're not going to pick, you know, being up in Mr. Bowles' office, you know, uh, versus being in the classroom. You know, we really do have a limited amount of behavior problems here. Yeah, the, there's been a huge change in the school since Mr. Irwin started working with our students, and even since he started working with the staff. Um, we, when I came to this school five years ago, uh, it was very much uh, kind of a students against the teachers sort of atmosphere, and and the kids didn't understand the teachers, and the teachers didn't necessarily know about the kids and what their needs were. And then when Mr. Irwin came and started working with the, the teachers first, I think that helped us to realize, you know, we need to sit down with our kids, we need to get to know our kids, we need to build relationships with our kids, and really kind of told us what the needs were and what we needed to address. Uh, there's been so many positives that it's really surprising to me that, you know, that we've taken a small school that had such a, a reputation in the beginning of being kind of a rough and tumble, almost an alternative-like school, and turning this into a school that everybody wants to be a part of now. It's made a huge difference. I think learning has to be fun mm -hmm. if you're going to keep kids motivated and keep kids on task. And really, with John's book, you can see that they can have a good time and learn actually a lot more without it costing any more time for the teacher. And the more that teachers will experiment with that and try that, the more they're going to see, wow, that really does work. And it's also great for them. You want to work in a joyful place, and if things are working out for you, um, you're going to feel it, that your workplace is joyful. It's just going to make you a better teacher. It's because of a lot of the work that they've done previous and prior to that. They set it up with the routines and procedures in their classroom. They've taught the game so that the students understand it. They work it out during their um, class meetings so that all that's in place in order for them to have a better learning environment. The program has been terrific. Um, the teachers are all on board, our administration's on board. Um, we all believe in it 100% and it makes a big difference when you devote to it 100%. You'll see it in your climate and you'll see it in your research. In the next seven programs in this course, you will be a virtual participant in the workshop that John presented to the Louisville educators. In this workshop, John will demonstrate how his classroom of choice ideas and practices can improve student-teacher relations, create a positive and productive learning environment, and teach students to take responsibility for their own behavior and learning. John begins this presentation by introducing himself and talking about how he developed his ideas in the Classroom of Choice book. He then involves the workshop participants in a hands-on demonstration of activities they can use with their students to improve relationships and develop trust. He then moves on to the subject of internal and external motivation and introduces the five basic human needs as specified by Dr. William Glasser's Choice Theory Psychology. As the workshop progresses, John will explain how understanding basic needs can help teachers manage student behavior. He shows how to develop a needs and strengths profile that can help teachers better understand students' choices about behavior and learning. This video course, The Classroom of Choice, will give you the opportunity to watch and learn from John's presentation to school team leaders, as well as then see these ideas used in real classrooms in a variety of school grades and settings. The first seven videos in this course will show John's presentation from beginning to end. You will hear how John came to create his program, about his background and experiences, and learn his practical tips for applying these principles in your very own classrooms.
Ideas covered in this presentation include understanding different types of motivation, creating a need-satisfying environment, using internal learning profiles, and implementing practical strategies to meet the five basic needs in the classroom. It is a hands-on conference, with teachers participating in relationship-building activities, as well as sharing their own experiences with each other. These videos are a valuable opportunity to experience a workshop tailored for teachers who are looking to learn more about how to implement choice theory in contemporary classrooms. We will now watch a short clip in which John addresses the topic of student motivation and how it relates to learning and responsible behavior. Uh, the topic today is motivation and it's how to appeal to intrinsic motivation in the classroom and it's giving kids what they need and then getting what we want and what we want I'm assuming is high quality learning student engagement and responsible behavior and by giving people what they need uh, you do get what you want it's not going to make the classroom a perfect place but it makes the classroom a better place for everybody okay um, so the day is going to be Experiential, um, which is going to be a little discomforting at times because we're going to have to do some furniture moving at times to do some of the activities uh, that are in the book. But it's going to be learning experientially uh, management and instructional strategies that uh, increase students' motivation to learn and behave responsibly. Uh, so we, we're going to experience some of the strategies, as many as we can fit in, and we need some content to experience these strategies around, and the content is going to be motivation. Um, we're going to be looking at intrinsic motivation, that's really the, the umbrella for the day. But we're going to be looking at uh, some research on the motivation continuum. Uh, it was done by DC and Ryan, a couple of researchers from the University of Rochester. Uh, we're going to be looking at what the five components of intrinsic motivation are. And they are Glasser, uh, Glasser based, the five basic needs uh, that William Glasser developed as part of choice theory. Um, we're going to be looking at your internal profile that we all have all five of the basic needs, but we have them in varying degrees. And that helps explain um, how our personalities differ. Um, we're going to be looking at the school and classroom hierarchy of the needs, and then finally look at the implications of all of this stuff to instruction and management. We, we have to start off with some essential questions. Uh, understanding by design tells us. So here are our essential questions for today. What is intrinsic motivation? Why focus on intrinsic motivation when we can uh, go back and focus on the behaviorist approach, which is external motivation? Uh, what are the components of intrinsic motivation? And then how can we appeal to intrinsic motivation in the classroom? Whether you are a teacher, a coach, or in any position in which you work with young people, you are first and foremost a manager. Managing is first creating the conditions for students to be interested in learning or performing, and then providing the structures, strategies, and activities that will encourage quality learning and responsible behavior. Teachers manage the learning space, time, materials, and the mental, physical, and emotional states of students. Effective teachers must be effective managers. In the next four video programs, you will see the classroom of choice in action as teachers put into practice the workshop ideas. The first of these videos has to do with problem solving. Even in the most effectively managed classroom, problems occasionally occur. When these problems involve the whole class or a group of students, the class meeting is an excellent venue for problem solving. In this video, we visit a fifth grade classroom at Randalls Elementary School in Flint, Michigan. The class has been discussing self-control and how to deal with problems that may arise in school. Let's watch as teacher Stacy Robbins facilitates the class meeting. Um, what I want you to think about is pretty much every single person, even Olivia said that she remembers the time losing self-control. I can't remember a specific one right now, but what were the consequences? Everybody can remember a time losing control. Nicole even said when she lost control, she had to step out of the room. So she lost the opportunity to be part of the community until she could handle it and come back in. So sometimes we lose self-control on purpose. Sometimes we lose self-control and something happens and our body's reacting to it. What are the consequences though? What are things that happen when you lose self-control? So think about the time you just shared. 
And what kind of consequences go with that? After the class meeting video, we travel to Dearborn, Michigan and the Dearborn Academy, a K-8 through charter school. John has been working with a group of student leaders and training them to teach choice theory to their fellow students. They have been discussing the behavior car, a choice theory analogy that illustrates how driving a car is similar to controlling one's behavior. Here John talks with the students about times when they have lost control of their behavior car. Thanks. Okay, I, got, I heard some good stories. Um, most of them had to do with uh, controlling your behavioral car. Just so quickly to review the behavioral car. Um, we're all driving our cars. We're on the road of life. And we're constantly making choices, so we're turning the wheel this way, that way, adjusting our, our car to the environment around us. Um, we have the four wheels of our car. We've got the thoughts, what we're thinking, what we're doing, or the actions. Um, we have our feelings and our physiology, and they're all going together all the time. And we can choose to let our feelings drive our behavior, so act out of anger or, um, or, or, or fear or let uh, our physiology drive us. Sometimes if I'm tired and hungry, it's easy to be irritable um, and behave that way. So we can let our back wheels drive our car or we can get in our front wheels, get in the front seat of the car and let our actions and thoughts affect our behavior, really take control. And uh, most of the stories I heard had something to do about getting in the front seat of your car when someone or something uh, was, dr you know, kind of uh, driving your back wheels, kind of pushing your back wheels to be angry or frustrated or something like that. And I heard you guys talk about s situations where you could have acted out of, you could have driven the car from the back seat. And you know what happens when you drive a car from the back seat. Things that <laughs> usually run into telephone poles, bless you. Uh, so, or you can get in the front seat. And so who would be willing to talk about, and, and nice, speak loudly so everybody can hear you, loudly so everybody can hear you, uh, tell us a, a story about uh, getting in the front seat. It's usually when I'm at home and my little sister, mm -hmm. things that she does, and I try not to like hit her or <laughs> yell or anything. So I get in the front seat and I just think about what I'm doing and how it's going to affect what's going to happen. So okay. I'm just leaving them does she do things that irritate you? Could you give an example? Um, How old is she? She's four. Four. Sometimes when I'm in my room doing my homework, um, she'll come to my room, take my phone, and have paper in her. Okay. Or she'll throw stuff at me. So it would be easy to get mad at her at that point, but you get in the front seat. Cool. In the next video, we visit the Creative Technology Academy in Grand Rapids, Michigan to see how choice theory concepts can be used to create need-fulfilling instruction. In this high school classroom, we'll watch as English teacher Katie Nimczewski uses a sense image reactivity in which students imagine what an event might look, sound, feel, or smell like. Today, we are going to be reading through all of this information about Haiti. And you can close your eyes while I'm reading it, and I want your senses to be activated. So start thinking about you know, what are you seeing in these images in your mind? What are you hearing if you were there? Um, what are you smelling? What, are you, what is your body feeling like? What are you touching with your hands if you were in this situation? Um, and finally, what would you actually taste in your mouth, if anything at all? Okay, you'll have lots of description. Um, just try to stay focused on taking in that information through your sensory sensors, <laughs> okay? So... You can close your eyes, but you have to jot down some notes at the same time. All right, here we go. It sounded like a tornado, followed by a bomb dropping. Then the noise under the ground started, said Franz Florestal from Atlanta, who was visiting Port-au-Prince. You heard the noise under the ground, and it's shaking and shaking, and everyone started running. Houses were falling and falling. All of the fences were falling. People were falling. People were crying. Twenty seconds later, it was over. There was nothing but rubble and dirt. You cannot see the air. All of a sudden, it's dark, he said. After that, you saw the sun. The sun was falling under the horizon. On the inside, In the next video, the we'll see an example of how to on create inside, a class constitution, on an essential part of John Irwin's we classroom of choice. Mr. Moses and his third and fourth grade students 
are creating a new class constitution to accommodate the needs of a new group of transfer students. Today, we are going to revisit and create a new constitution. On this morning, Aleda, you had taken ours and thrown it in the garbage over there and gotten rid of the other one. Um, that, was, that was from the beginning of the year, and we've had a lot of new students since then, and I think it's important that we go back and recreate it with all those people so that we know as we, well, who, who can remember what a constitution was? What was the purpose of the constitution? What is a constitution for? And what does it mean? Ethan? Um, it's for the rules of the classroom. What do you mean by the rules? Like, what, what we want people to do in the classroom. Okay. What else does con a constitution mean to you guys? When I say constitution. Olivia? Um, and what it means to have a, to have a constitution means the rules in the classroom and what you're supposed to do in the classroom. Okay. Now, who's created a constitution? I know we created one this year. Who's created one in another class before? Okay. Who has never been a part of creating a constitution before? All right. So, many of you haven't. Interesting. Um, the, to me, a constitution is important. And this is why I want to do this, again, because of the new students. It's important because you guys are setting up what's expected. It's not me telling you this is what has to happen. It's not Mrs. Hafiji coming in and saying this is what has to happen. You guys are saying these are the things that we're saying are good things to happen in here. These are going to be the things that we don't want to happen in here. And separate this, those, those two things. Okay? So that's going to be your job today. I'm not, it's not my job, it's your job. And you guys are going to work on those together. There are many benefits to making your classroom a classroom of choice. Among those benefits is the extra instructional time you will gain by teaching your students to take control of their own behavior and learning. These skills will be invaluable to students in their pursuit of happy, productive lives and satisfying relationships both in and outside of school. And now let's watch as John concludes his workshop. I just want to thank you. It's been a joy preaching to the choir. Um, your, your students and your teachers, if you're a principal, are very lucky to have you. One of the best compliments I can give a school is I wish my kid could go to your school. And from the conversations I've had today, I'm thinking of moving to Louisville. Um, but I just want to end with this uh, little Zen invocation. The way is long, let us work, let's go together, let's work together. The way is difficult, let's help each other. You don't have to be a, uh, just a, a contractor, you know, subcontractor alone in your room. You can work with others. The way is joyful, enjoy the kids. They're acting their age, and that's bad, but enjoy them. They are acting their age, and they're just kids. Uh, the way is ours alone, let us go in love. And finally, the way grows before us, let us begin. Thank you, it's been a pleasure. I hope you got something useful out of today. Thank you.